where you are. Think of the message last week. Wherever it is that he was, that's where Moses wanted to be. And that's what he told God. God, I don't even want to go to the promised land if you're not going to go there with me. I'd rather stay here in this wilderness if that's the place where you are. I don't even want to go past here. Hallelujah. If you remember about three weeks ago now, we started into this study on different sections and subjects and aspects um, of Jeremiah, both the book and the person, right? And um, we read a portion of scripture in that beginning week from Jeremiah chapter 31. And the focus that week was on the parts of those scriptures that told of God showing himself as being the God of again. Do we remember that? And that was our title for the message that evening as well. In chapters 30 and 31 of Jeremiah, they're known by a lot of scholars or referred to as the scroll of consolation or the little scroll of consolation. And that is what we saw there with that focus being on him being the God of again. Okay, to console is just to alleviate grief, okay, or to take away a sense of loss or a sense of trouble. If you console someone, right? What happens? A little kid cries and, and the mother consoles them. What are they doing? They're trying to alleviate their discomfort or their grief or their trouble, right? And so just as Simeon in the temple, uh, he had awaited what the coming Messiah his entire life. He was an old, old man in the temple. And as Mary and Joseph brought in the Christ child to him and brought him before him, and Simeon at that time had all that he had hoped for in a lifetime, all resting in his arms as an old man, Messiah, the consolation of Israel. Just as Isaiah had prophesied in chapter 40, verse 1 and 2, comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Verse 2, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. Now there is no consolation like the consolation of hearing that your trouble is over, that you are to be comforted, and that what your sin has been paid for. Four. Amen. And God speaking to the people here in Jeremiah of the restoration that was going to come to them, right? That was the consolation of Israel as well. And was speaking of it in a prophecy that would be looked back on for generations. I will again build you back. The God of again. Build back better wasn't a farce of a campaign slogan back then. It was the plan and the fulfillment of that plan by the God who is anything but a farce and a letdown and a poor cowardly excuse of a leader of people. God's build back better was in proving to his people Israel that he was the God of again. And that he would again build them back up from where they were. As a people and as a nation and as an example. And doesn't he do the same thing with us as a people? As an example to others, doesn't he build our lives back up again through his son? Jesus is going to be spoken of all through this message tonight, even though I'm not going to say his name very many times. And I want you to catch that. Okay, we sang the song, I speak the name of Jesus, and I'm like, I brought the right cup tonight, because it has the lyrics to that song on it. Yes. Speak in the name of Jesus, because his name is power, his name is healing, his name is life. He breaks every stronghold. He shines through the shadows, and he burns like a fire, amen? So you will again sing and play and dance, he told them. You will again plant your vineyard and harvest it. You will again rejoice in your streets and live with peace within your walls. You will again because I am the God of again. And so I'll give you opportunity again to be in covenant with me again. Hallelujah. 
And so I'm going to take us back there again tonight, back to Jeremiah chapter 31, as we begin in the message titled, Favor in the Wilderness. But this time, although it's going to be the same exact set of scriptures that we're going to open with, there's going to be um, a different purpose and a different focus and a different theme that's going to be pulled out of those same scriptures, okay? So again, let's read like we did in week one. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 1 through 6 says, At this time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says, the people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness. There's our title. I will come to give rest to Israel. Verse 3, the Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you in or I will build you up again. He says, I've drawn you in with unfailing kindness. Verse 4, I will build you up again and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your timbrels or your tambourines and go out and dance with the joyful. Verse 5, again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. Verse 6, there will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim. Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord, our God. Starting out, I want us to catch two things here. Number one, nothing is more maybe absolutely breathtakingly beautiful than a divine again that comes into our lives after some form of a disastrous again has been there. And can we relate to that at all? There's just nothing quite like the times when God brings us into one of these glorious, like, again, I'm the God of again. Here I am again. I'm reaching out my hand to you again. I'm reaching out in love to you again. I'm reaching out again with forgiveness for you. And especially, those times are even more precious, especially after we have found ourselves in a here we go again moment. Have we ever had a uh, Oh my goodness, here we go again. Kind of moment, right? We don't have to expound on those. Probably different for each of us. But how great is it, especially in those times, when we can see grace as his countenance. When we can witness redemption beyond all bounds after a repeated circling of the same tree in the wilderness. I will never, ever forget a message that I heard a very long time ago in my life at the precise right exact moment I needed to hear it, and it was don't see the same tree twice. The Israelites in the wilderness wandered around in circles, and guess what? When you see a tree, and it's like, let's think of a failing or a sin in your life, and you see that tree, the worst thing you could ever do in life is to just circle back again and find yourself in the same condition, or the same hole, or the same pit, or the same sin, or circling the same tree all over again. And it was, don't see the same tree twice. And I'm like, I'm sick of seeing this tree. There's a whole bunch of trees on this earth, and I'd rather see the beauty of a tree that God has for me to see than seeing this old, dead, dried-up tree that I keep circling back to. Amen? So when you can witness redemption beyond all bounds after a repeated cycling of the same tree in the wilderness, when you can feel his love after the deepest of heartache, When you can sense his presence after loneliness has made us its closest companion. How about when we can hear his voice after a seemingly unending period of silence? Have you ever been like, hello? What's the song? Is anybody out there? (laughs) He says there, what? You survived the sword and found favor in the wilderness. And do we see what that says there? It doesn't say that once you come out of the wilderness, all will go better for you. (laughs) Because that would be like a, well, duh, (laughs) moment, wouldn't it? 
As soon as you're out of the wilderness and you step foot in the promised land, things will be better. Thanks. Yeah, I get it. I know. Thanks, Captain Obvious. I figured that much out already. I need to get from here to there. Thanks, I got it. But that's not what God is saying there. He's saying that there is favor in. There is favor while in the wilderness. Mm. Whatever wilderness you may find yourself in, whether that be now or in a time that lies ahead, there is divine favor for you in that wilderness. And do you know that there is capacity for you in Christ? Capacity, a special role or a position, capacity. I'm going to fill in in this capacity, not capacity as in the volume of something that can be held. Capacity as in I'm going to fill this role in this capacity. Okay, a role or a position, a post, an appointment, okay, a function that he has for you. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, when he, he includes the text in Philippians 4.13, right, where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you know that was not written with the intended meaning that we would have more stamina in a basketball game, like Steph Curry seems to imply? in his campaign ads. That's, that's not what that scripture meant. Instead, it meant that there was nothing that you would not be able to do when relying solely on the strength provided for you by Jesus Christ. Amen. Every song we sang tonight, it was about, I can't do this, but only you can. Amen. It was about, this is all awful, but nothing's impossible with you. Amen. That's how I summed it all up in my head. Like, I'm praying through half of worship or more, just going, God, this is astounding. Each and everything that's spoken of and we sing about, like, all of it's impossible, but none of it's impossible because you're the God of impossible and impossible is your starting point. And so that scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is that we wouldn't be able to do anything except for relying solely on the strength that is provided for by him. So there is capacity for you in Christ, and there is a strength afforded to you to be able to fully function in that capacity. Have we ever heard of somebody filling in or functioning in the capacity of a certain role or a title? Guess what? There's a strength that is afforded to us so that we're able to fully function in that capacity and not to have just survived the sword because sometimes that's what we think we have to do, especially those of us like battle, like warrior, yeah, like those are the messages I like and the scriptures I hold on to and the songs I like to beller from the back row of the church, right, about victory, And about battle, that's the Lord's. And about, yeah, I always think of Jesus for some reason. Like, we're battle buddies. Like, we like that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. But guess what? It's not just about surviving the sword. That's not what it's, it's not just about surviving the battle. He says, yeah, you're going to survive the sword. Whatever that looks like in your own personal life. Yes, you are going to survive the sword. But he goes past that. And he says, but favor. Maybe even it's favor when you least expect it. Maybe it's even favor when you least expect it because you also believe you least deserve it. Maybe it's that kind of favor. Maybe that wilderness you're in is kind of your own doing. Maybe you've seen that same tree more than once because you're the stupid one walking around in circles and chasing your tail and seeing the same tree more than once. And you have no one to blame but yourself for the place that you're in. You don't have to raise your hand. I've been there in that wilderness. And guess what? It would have been very hard for me to accept a word from God that said, I'm going to shine favor down upon you right now in that place you're in. Mm Mm-mm. No, just don't even look at me right now. Like, I don't even want you to have to see me like this. 
let alone that you're going to look on me and have some kind of great love for me and pour that out on me and show favor on me in this time? No, just don't. Just don't. Just go somewhere else. Somebody else deserves it. Not me. So you're not just going to survive the sword, whatever that looks like and whatever that means in your life, but favor when you least expect it and sometimes when you least expect it because you also feel like you least deserve it. Favor not only to bring you out of the wilderness, but favor found for you and placed upon you and poured over you while still in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Have you ever found yourself, we're going to use the word spiraling. Maybe you're even there now. It's almost like you're trying to tread water, but it's almost worse than that because it's a sinking. It's a spiraling. And you feel it happening, and you can sense yourself going there. And sadly, most of the time, it's even a familiar feeling as it's happening. Whether it's in your thoughts... Okay, some of you might not know where I'm going with this. I'm going to give you a couple of different examples. Whether it's in your thoughts, like a, a woe is me mindset, but more severe than that. Okay, like a pity party of sorts, but on steroids. Okay, <laughs> like that. Or whether it's a once known to you sin or addiction that suddenly just rears its ugly head and tries to take you down a very familiar but wished forgotten road, okay? Or whether it's in your mental health, like the times that you feel like you can't even get out of bed, can't even pull those covers off your head, let alone go out in public and be a functioning, productive member of society. Like, really? Or maybe it's in a different spiritual aspect of life. And this one you might be able to relate to even more where you're just going through the motions. And you know it. It's not even like somebody has to wake you up to the fact that you're just going through the motions. You even know it, but you just can't seem to like snap out of it. And get to that place of joy that you once had, or that you've at least heard that other people experience, but you've never actually had, but you don't want to admit that to anybody. This joy that I have, the world can't take it from me. Well, they aren't going to be able to anyway because I don't know what you're talking about because I ain't never had it before. But everybody else does, so I just smile too because, yay, Jesus. Maybe it all just feels like a chore. The church attendance and the Bible reading and the volunteering. Just another thing on the to-do list of things in life. Just another expectation that's been placed on us or that we've even placed on ourselves. Whatever the area, any of those or a whole gamut of other ones, that you feel yourself spiraling. And what's worse is when it's a familiar feeling. But can I assure you of something and encourage you with something and shine a light of truth into the darkness that you might find yourself in in those times is that we serve a God of divine drivenness to restore his people. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been driven towards something? Almost like you can't explain it. Like there is just this propellant inside of you that just like pushes you towards something, right? Maybe it's even just like a hobby. But like every other hobby, lay it out on the table and you're like, eh. But this one thing, you're just like, yeah, right? Pastor Steve and I had breakfast like a month or so ago. And he was like, what's your passion? What are the things in ministry where you're just like, yes. And we talked about those things. That's that propulsion inside of you, that, that momentum like this isn't a chore and this isn't work and this is what I just thrive on and, and this is what I can't wait to get the chance to do again and, and all that other stuff is mundane and I go, yeah, yeah, I'll get to it, but let's do this, right. that, right? We serve a God who has that inside of him, that drivenness and it's divine and it's for your restoration, 
that's what, he's just like, yeah, this is where I thrive. This is what I love to do. I love to pull my people out of the muck and the mire. It's how I even formed them and created them to begin with. I like made dirt and I formed it and I, that's how I made my people. Guess what? Like when, the, when they were blind and I just, I made more mud and I just spit on it. I just stuck it in his eye because that's what I do. I create and I restore and I have a divine drivenness to restore my children. That's God. Amen. And that's the God we serve to save us, what? From our spiraling and to bring a halt to the death spin that we find ourselves in. Have you ever heard of like a death spiral? Yeah. Guess what? Once it starts, you can't stop it. It's just, that's it. But who can stop it? God can. It is such a drivenness within him that in order for you to not be restored by God, you actually have to not want to be restored by God. How good is that? Yeah. Not just like that, no, I don't deserve it. Don't look on me. Uh, no, you have to actually like defiantly say, I don't want you to help me. Because that's how determined he is with each of his children. And he's no less determined with you, each and every one of you, than he is with any of the rest of us. Because that's a lie that the enemy will like to draw you in on. Oh, yeah, I believe that's true of God because he's good. Oh, yeah, I believe that's true for everyone else because they're his children. But me, I'm like this anomaly. I'm this outcast. I'm this island. I'm this special, not special, but you know, special mention at the end type of person. The afterthought. That's what the enemy wants you to think. Oh, yeah, God is good. We'll give you that. And he's in the restoration business. Yeah, but for everybody else except for me. He's no less determined to restore any of you than he is to restore all of you. Amen? And our second one fits in perfectly here. And this is the truth that no discovery is less expected than favor in the wilderness. Remember, that's our title tonight, Favor in the Wilderness, okay? So we have nothing is more like absolutely amazing, breathtakingly beautiful than a divine again after some form of a disastrous again that has happened in our life. And the second one now is that no discovery is less expected than when we discover that there's actually favor for us while we're in the wilderness, okay? And that favor is what I was touching on as we closed out last week, all right, when I recounted you the words that I had written earlier that day, which were kind of, if any of you know, it's like a form of poetry. It's called spoken word. Um, it was kind of spoken word-esque, all right? And I assured you that the wilderness is not what he had for his children, and it's not where they stayed. But there was still much to see of his provision while they were in it, and there was still much to see of his presence while they traversed it, Right? with sandals that never wore down and food that hovered above the ground, remember? With clear signs of his glory and jaw-dropping escape stories, with provision and health and holding their enemy's wealth, with his voice thundering even in their wandering, with his law of protection, even amidst their rejection, with his mercy enduring and his instruction reassuring. They were a lesson in the making, yet they were his children from the beginning. And his provision and his presence and his represent, they're all representations of him and his love for them, but they were all representations of him and his love for us as well. And I want us to grasp that this evening. God's provisions and God's presence are representations of God's favor. And no discovery is less expected than favor in the wilderness. So when you're out there in the desert, 
It's not usually the time that you'd expect divine favor. But it comes every time if we're just willing to, what, reach out and accept it, right? Okay. Now, as I said at the beginning, we're pulling some different things out of these verses tonight, okay? Um, Different than what we did the first time around. This isn't the every again that God's going to bring out, okay? Instead, we're going to touch on some different aspects of it. So if we go to verse 3 again, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, it says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, we just read this a few minutes ago, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Now, we see so clearly here that God reaches towards his people with kindness motivated by deep and everlasting love. Is anybody else sick yet of the saying, be kind? Like, there's a lot of us women, especially here at Mercy, who are in this group on Facebook for the t-shirt lady. Okay, and she makes all these t-shirts, and they're beautiful, and Christine, we love your t-shirts, we'll still keep buying them, but how many of them are like, be kind, and I'm not just saying her t-shirts, I'm saying across the board, every coffee mug, every t-shirt, every bumper sticker, every, and now they started putting bees with them, so it's like B-E-E, because that's some, oh, let's like put a spin on it, so now they have to buy this one too, and be kind, and I'm like, I'm so sick to death of being told to be kind, I don't want to be kind, (laughs) But it's not just about being kind, and that's why. So this isn't God's just kindness because, like, somebody showed him a T-shirt that told him he was supposed to be kind. No, this is kindness motivated by deep and everlasting love. That's the kind of kindness that we're supposed to have. Kindness is actually a fruit of the Spirit, right? It's not something that we can just be all on our own anyway, And why is that? It's because it has to be the kind of kindness that is like the kind of love that God gives, and that is a kindness that is motivated by this deep and everlasting love. And it's how he was then, but it's how he is still now. He is eager to do the best for them if they will only allow him. And he's eager to bring the same things to pass for us if we but allow him as well, right? Remember, he's a gentleman. How many times do I say God is a gentleman? He's never going to force himself upon anyone against their will, right? So after many words of warning about sin, we know that Jeremiah had to give so many words of warning to the people, right? Then all of a sudden we come to these verses, and these verses are a reminder of God's magnificent love. And it's like a breath of fresh air. It was probably like a breath of fresh air for Jeremiah to get to speak them. Okay, anybody who has handled the word and given out the word, if you're just given a hard word week after week to give to the people and you're like, oh my gosh, and finally he like gives you a nice soft fluffy word, you're like, yes, thank you. That's so much easier to speak, right? Yeah, that was probably Jeremiah here. Like, it was like a breath of fresh air. Like, oh, I get to tell them about God's love and his restorative power and favor in the wilderness. Yay, thank you, God, right? Because rather than thinking with God with dread, as many of them had begun to do, like, oh, I hear the word God, and I hear all of these things that are going to happen to us, and I just start equating dread every time I hear his name. And that's not what he intended to happen, right? And some of us at some point in our life, or maybe now, if we're honest, might have that same connection that sometimes happens. Like, ugh. Like when I talked about the mundane or the to-do list or the, it's just something else that needs done. It's just something else to feel guilty about at the end of the day if I don't think I did enough. It's just... That's not the joy of having a desire within you to live your life, to serve and and be an ambassador of your Savior, right? And so if you've ever found yourself in that place, um, excuse me, I implore you to look carefully and see him in the light that's going to be shown 
on him here, okay? And we're going to look on this as we read verse 3 again. He lovingly draws them and each of us to himself. And this is how he called out to them. (coughs) Excuse me. It was in love. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. That wasn't that be kind. Like, don't ever say anything that ruffles anybody's feathers because we have to be kind. That wasn't that kind of kindness, right? And the time that he had spoken to that, that wasn't just coming through the prophet Jeremiah right here in Jeremiah 31.3, okay? The time he'd spoken that, because what did it say? It said, the Lord appeared to us in the past saying. So he's already said these words. Jeremiah is just kind of like repeating them or reiterating them, right? So the time he had spoken that... <coughs> Those words of love was in the book of Hosea. And so I want you to listen to these words of his. They're found in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. And they're appropriately found under a heading in the scriptures that says, God's love for Israel. So this is Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. Verse 3, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts up a little child to the cheek and I bent down to feed them. Am I the only one or can you hear Almost like the pain in his voice here as he says these words. The deep love, yeah, but also the pain. The far off reminiscing of how he loved them and how he'd cared for them. How he'd provided for them. And then if we break it down even more, If we study it out a little more, then we see that those verses actually lead us somewhere else, right? So these verses in Jeremiah led us to Hosea 11. (coughs) Excuse me, sorry. Hosea 11 takes us to the words of the psalmist Asaph. Hope we know Book of Psalms was not all written by David, correct? It wasn't. Moses, David... Asaph, different ones. So we're coming to Psalm 78. Now, this entire chapter is astounding. Like, go back and read that tonight. Psalm 78, okay? It's, um, it gives an amazing recounting and a retelling of the Israelites' journey from captivity to Egypt to being freed, um, to their wilderness wanderings. And it's all given through the lens of God's love for them all throughout the entire chapter. So if we realize that, like if we look at Psalm 78, or if we even think of the Psalms as talking about a time where the Israelites are being referred to, right? So for time's sake, though, we're not going to do that. Excuse me. We're going to read verses 23 through 25. So if somebody can read for me, it's there on the screen. Psalm 78, 23 through 25. 22. Let's start at 22. Sorry, Donnie. Yeah. Psalm 78, 22 through 25. 
Okay, it says, they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Let's just think of that. They didn't believe in God. They didn't trust in his deliverance. They're already his people, guys. They're already taken captive by Egypt here. This is when he's writing about. And he says, but they didn't believe in God, and they didn't trust in his deliverance. Verse 23, yet. What does that mean? It means like, even so. Yet. Like, in spite of. Yet. This is what happens. So they didn't even believe in God. They didn't trust in his deliverance. Yet, in spite of, even though of that fact, he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. And read verse 25. Human beings ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. That, that right there is favor in the wilderness. They didn't even believe in God, it says. Verse 22, they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Talk about being in the wilderness and going, not me. No, don't look at me. Don't shine that favor upon me. No. I still believed in his existence. I still believed he could deliver people. I just didn't feel I was worthy of it, right? This is like altogether even more compounded than that. This is like they don't even believe in him for these things or that he's even capable. And yet, what does he do? He commands the skies above. What are we saying? Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the windows of heaven. Let it rain. He gave a command to the skies, open the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Human beings ate the bread of angels, and he sent them all the food they could eat. That is favor in the wilderness, and that's what I'm talking about, about not just surviving the sore. It's not just about surviving the sword. It's also about having favor in the wilderness. And all based not on their performance, was it? No. <laughs> not based on their merit. Not based on their perfection. Because that would have gotten them nowhere, right? Where would our own have got us? What if it was based on our, our performance? How would we do? Hmm. What if it was based on your merit? Would you do well? Dear Lord. I'm struggling up here, guys. What if it was based on your ability to be perfect and your ability to be righteous? How would you do then? Right, we can't be, and neither could they, but yet when we're standing over here and when we're going, <laughs> nah, just don't look on me, why? Why is that our outlook? That's our outlook because we think it has to do with our performance or our merit or our perfection, and it doesn't. I can't merit the forgiveness and the favor and the love of God. Nothing in my life merits it. it. I'm not worth it. I'm not worthy of it. Okay? There's like buzzwords that drive me crazy. And I try not to talk about it often. Okay? One of them is deserve. Like, oh, I'm so happy for you. No one deserves it more than you. And I'm like, we don't deserve anything. It's all God, right? Well, another one is worthy. Like, oh, I'm just his, so I am worthy. And I'm like, we're worthy of nothing. Everything we have is just a gift from him. Amen. Everything I lived made me worthy of hell. It made me worthy of death. I couldn't do anything on my own. Melissa just said, we can't be perfect on our own. We can't be righteous on our own. We can't be. It's only through him and us accepting that free gift of salvation that he has provided for us. 
And so that love that he shows them and that provision that he gave to them and that favor that he poured out on them in the wilderness, it was not based on their performance or their merit or their perfection because if it was, (laughs) they'd have starved to death on day one. But instead, it was all based on his love for them and on that divine drivenness that he has within him to just restore his people. So did you notice how God addresses his people? Again, he's speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, right? But these are not Jeremiah's words. These are God's words, okay? And they didn't come... Um, from God through Jeremiah until they'd actually already come from God through another prophet, which was Hosea, which we just picked up on, right? So these couple of verses here in Jeremiah 31, like verse 3 and verse 4, those aren't even like God speaking to Jeremiah, like these new words. These are him telling the people to replay back to them the words of Hosea, all right? And so we just went through all of verse 3, but now as we get to verse 4, do we catch how God... Um, how he references them, what he says to them there. How does he refer to them in verse 4? He says, I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, I will rebuild. Is anybody else thinking it? First of all, I want to point out to you, in case it hasn't already crossed your mind, or maybe it has and you just didn't want to like think it or say it because it's one of those red in the face moments that we speak of those things. But Israel, if we didn't already know, they had been anything but virgin. Right. Okay? Up to this point. Because theologically speaking, all right, from the throne of God's perspective looking down, all right, idolatry is a form of adultery, okay? We see it all throughout the Old Testament especially. Idolatry is equated to or equal to adultery, right? What? You will have no other gods before me, okay? Because if you do, you're what? Placing something above me, you're lusting after or serving or worshiping that thing more than me, you are basically what? You're cheating on God or you're what? You're in love with another other than the one that's supposed to be the lover of your soul. All of these are definitions or descriptions of adultery. We could put them in line with a a human physical relationship, right? Um, Go ahead, like try to bring in four other people into your household and into your marriage and just go, yeah, it's okay because I love you too. How would that fly? (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Sister wives. Okay, it flies for some, but I don't know how. Okay. But how would that go? It wouldn't go very well, right? Yeah, not in my household. I don't know, like hopefully not in any of yours either. All right, that doesn't go well. Why? Because that's considered fornication. It's considered adultery, okay? It's, so that's how idol worship was seen from the perspective of the throne of God. Idol worship equated to adultery, all right? And so... In this case, Israel had been very adulterous then. And he, at many other times, he let them know that, and he didn't shy away from it, that they had been unfaithful, that they had been adulterous, even going so far as to say that they had practiced whoredom, all right, and had been involved in all types of harlotry. And it's in there, it's in the book of Amos, it's in the book of Hosea, it's elsewhere, but wow, Scripture can be... So um, it can use such vivid language, can it? And it can be so colorful in its descriptions of things, can it? But it can in its wording because the people, they hadn't been shy either. So just like scripture isn't shy to use like this vivid imagery or this, this colorful wording here to get the point across of what God thinks, okay? Guess what? The people hadn't been shy either, though. And they hadn't been shy in flaunting themselves in the worship of the pagan customs and cultures that were in their neighboring and surrounding areas. Okay, they hadn't even tried to, like, hide it from God. They just blatantly put it out there, okay? And so here, though, he doesn't speak of that. 
He spoke about that through Amos. He spoke about that through Hosea. They had heard it before, but here he says something completely different, and we might get caught off guard with that, right? He speaks to them of what he sees for them. Everybody say, for them. For them. Yeah, not what he currently sees coming from them, but instead what he sees for them. That which will be available to them because of what? The consolation of Israel, which is our consolation as well because of Jesus. So it's like the times that he's looked on us in our sin and yet has spoken to us about redemption. And it's like the time when he's seen us in our pain and instead he has called us whole. It's like the times when he's seen us in his sickness and instead he has called us healed. It's like the times when he has seen us in our weakness and instead he has said, it's okay because I'm going to clothe you with my strength. And it's as he goes on to speak through Jeremiah here later in chapter 31, in verse 17, he states these words, and this is what we're going to close with. He says, there is hope for your future, says the Lord. So he has just called Israel, who was anything but virgin, he has called them, O virgin Israel. And then he goes on a few verses later and he says, there is hope for your future, says the Lord. That's what he was speaking to them of. He was speaking to them through the lens of seeing them as redeemed because of the consolation of Israel that would come. And so for each and every one of us, what that means is that you don't dare give up. And you don't dare give in. And you don't dare lose hope when you find yourself spiraling. And you don't dare even lose hope and give up and give in when you see the same tree again. And maybe it's not just twice. Maybe it's for the 35th time. Okay, I want you to not become weary in the wilderness because God is the God who has a drivenness inside of him to restore his people. And so Galatians 6, 9 tells us, do not become weary in well-doing for in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart. Amen? Amen. And so the favor doesn't just come so much of the time in our lives. You guys can stand with me. So much of the time we think that the favor equates to the promised land. Like that's the end goal. We're just trudging through. We're just struggling through. We're just trying to go through this desert and get a drop of water on our tongue so we can make it to the promised land. But while you're in the wilderness, there is a capacity for you in Christ There is a drivenness by our God to restore you. And there is a favor that will be poured out on you where he will not just save you from the sword, but he will also pour out his favor, his presence, his provision on you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this night, Lord God. I thank you that although sick in body, Lord, you have brought out your word through me this night. may not be well, with my physical man, but it is well with my soul, Father, and I thank you for this day. I thank you for this word, and I pray that the words of it would penetrate into the deepest places of us, that they would change us, not only to make us more like you, Father God, as I pray so often, but Father, that they would give us a new outlook and a new perspective on you and your love for us. Not your love for your creation as a whole, but individual, focused, pinpointed, spotlighted love for each and every one who has been under the sound of my voice tonight. Let us get a full glimpse and grasp of that momentum and that divine drivenness that you have within you, not to just save the whole world, but Lord, to restore each of us individually. Because your love, while it does go broad like the expanse of the whole world, your love also, Father God, is so pinpointed 
and so precious and so perfected toward each and every one of us individually. And so, Father, I pray that your children would be able to grasp that tonight. That they would realize it's not based on their performance or their merit or their perfection. It's not if they deserve it. It's not if they feel or are worthy of it, Father God. It's none of that. It's the free gift of salvation. And all they have to do is open their hands to receive it from you, to believe in you for it, and to be grateful and thankful that you've offered it to each and every one of us. So, Father, I pray that these capacities that each of us are able to fill through the strength of your Son, Father God, that they would be made realized to each and every one. Lord, so often we call it a calling. What is God's call on our lives? Well, Lord, let them see it also as a role that you have for them to fill in this earth, Lord God, a capacity that they are to live out and to be able to fill, and that it won't be through their own strength, just as our salvation isn't based on our own merit. Lord, instead, it's going to be on your strength going to be done in your name and it's going to be done for your glory hallelujah hallelujah we thank you for it all in Jesus name